porch. <laughs> we won't call it a band, but you know, we won't be a band. It'll just be a, you, you heard the expression, the mixed multitude that followed the children of Israel. <laughs> That's what we'll be. Um, anyways, that, that should be a lot of fun. We'll, if you play an instrument, let me know. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Tonight we're looking at the subject of, again, of forgiveness. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, let's start there. I gave out some sheets and we'll gradually work our way through that tonight. It, it, it's such an important subject that I, I think it's worth us taking more than one week on it. We might, we might finish on it tonight. I might go another week. But uh, I can guarantee you, if you're alive, you're going to be wronged. <laughs> and probably more than once a day. Um, in the home, at work, by strangers, by people who say they love you, by government, by uh, situations. It, it, it just happens. That's the world we live in. We live in a sinful, fallen world. And if you don't have a handle on mercy and grace and forgiveness, you're going to go nuts. <laughs> I mean, really. We need to understand forgiveness. And it starts... It's not the subject tonight, but it starts with God's mercy and grace toward us. You need to understand that, first of all, and that makes it a whole lot easier to show it toward others. You know, it, you just, it'll really help you. But here in Colossians chapter 3, uh, there's two main verses I go to when we, we look at forgiveness. Uh, this one, and as well, uh, the one in, in Ephesians, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. He says much the same thing here, but he, he takes a little bit different tact in that he talks about uh, as Christ forgave that we need to forgive. Colossians 3, let me read just a few verses starting in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We just stop reading there. Uh, particularly verse 13 there. Uh, forbearing one another. There's some interesting words here in verses 12 and 13. If you don't understand them, look them up. Get a, get a handle on them. Bowels of mercy is a real interesting uh, uh, description, uh, forbearing one another, uh, verse 13, forgiving one another, and then in case you didn't understand that, if any man have a quarrel against any, we understand that, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You know, forgiveness is, is such an important part of life. Uh, we can't always pardon someone. Now, that has to do with legal things. Uh, God has put certain authorities in, in place, uh, and we can't pardon someone before God. But we can deal with our hearts. And uh, what we're talking about here tonight is our response. You know, the, the tendency is to focus on the offender or on the offense. But our focus really needs to be on ourselves. Uh, our response is our most important concern. And uh, that's, that's what we want to uh, focus on. That's what we want to understand. Uh, quite often in life, you'll have a natural response. And then you'll need to, the Holy Spirit will poke you and the Holy Spirit will be working on you, then you'll need to have the spiritual response. You know, you'll, you'll be grieved, or you'll be bitter, or whatever. And then you'll say, well, God wants me to forgive. And you, you'll deal, hopefully you'll, you'll deal with it. Our response, so important. N number one there, forgiveness views the offender as a tool in God's hand. Yeah, we, we often focus on the offense and the offender, and we don't stop to think, well, what is God doing through that situation? You can look in, in 2 Samuel with me, if, if you would. There's a real interesting illustration of this in the life of David. 2 Samuel chapter 16. Most of you will be familiar with this. You, you, you remember when Absalom was trying to take over the kingdom? Absalom was David's son. <laughs> And he's trying to take over the kingdom. So David and his men march out of the city. I think there's a lot of reasons for it. But anyway, he and his men are marching out of the city. And in 2 Samuel 16, verse, verse 5, 
So help me if I get in 2 Samuel. Verse 16. Where am I? 2 Samuel 16, verse 5. Boy, two mistakes already. So it's chapter 16, verse 5. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. That, that should cause you to remember something. That's the former king. Whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all his mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Uh, here comes this guy. He's cursing David. He's throwing rocks. And then down in, uh, in verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Now, he meant that literally, <laughs> with his sword. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And listen to this. David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son which came forth of my bowels seeketh my life. How much more may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. And here's the verse I want you to see. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Man, that, that's a spiritual response, isn't it? He, he could have easily had his man go over and say, yeah, just cut his head off. You know, make him shorter. Uh, but he didn't. He said, you know, maybe the Lord is just doing something here uh, in this. There's, a, there's another interesting sidelight to this in verses uh, 7 and 8. Because Shemiah is the product of not forgiving. He's coming out cursing, and you know, here's, here's this bitter man. This is a result of not forgiving. Uh, look at verse 7. I kind of hate to read this even. Thus said Shemiah when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. Now stop and think there. Did David take over from Saul by his own decision? No. God put David in. God took Saul out. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief because thou art a bloody man. Man, he's, he's upset with David. That didn't start that day. He's been bitter the whole time. He has an unforgiving spirit. He's of the house of Saul. And that's exactly the product you'll get if you don't forgive. It gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. Uh, forgiveness views the offender as a tool in God's hands. Secondly, forgiveness sees our wounds as God's way of drawing attention to the offender's needs. You know, we, we don't, this is not usually your first thought, but when someone wrongs you, it's because they're wrong. You know, when they wrong you um, without any, re, you know, unreasonably. And that happens. It just happens. Uh, forgiveness sees our wounds as God's way of drawing attention to the offender's needs. Th there's an incident in the life of Paul in Acts chapter 16 where he's preaching. I think it's in Thyatira. And this woman follows him around, basically harassing him. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination, that means she's demon-possessed, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. <laughs> so here's Paul trying to just go about his business, you know, ministering and so on. And here's this woman following him around, just harassing him. And Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. If you know the story, her masters were upset because she could no longer tell fortunes. That should tell you something about fortune telling, by the way. Uh, but anyway, uh, forgiveness doesn't just see the, the wounds. It sees the one that wounded me has a, has a need, has a problem. That girl had a terrible need. I mean, she was demon possessed. What an awful way to live. And uh, Paul was able to relieve her of that. Thirdly, forgiveness recognizes that bitterness is assuming a right we do not have. 
Uh, the verse that I would give you here is Romans 12, verse 19. I guess there's a lot of verses like this, but this is a verse where you at least need to know where it is. Uh, Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is not a right that we have. Um, now, I know in the Old Testament that there was times when they had that and so on, but they, we're not there. Uh, vengeance belongs to the Lord. And when he says, give place unto wrath, you could easily misunderstand that, <laughs> that verse. What he's saying is, wrath has its place, and it's not in your house. It's God's house. Yeah, give place to wrath. Let it be in its right place. Um, only God has the right to punish. And really, you know, when people wrong us, that's, that's usually our natural first response. Someone punches you, the, the natural response is, no, I'll punch them back. Um, forgiveness recognizes that bitterness is assuming a right we do not have. Fourthly, forgiveness realizes the offender has already begun receiving his consequences. You know, you see that in, in, in any illustration that you would, you would care to, to list. Uh, when people uh, offend us, they're, they're going to get the results of, of what they're doing. The Bible has, God has a, a rule. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And when we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. When we sow to the Spirit, we'll reap life everlasting. And uh, that's true for us. It's true for, for others. And we need to cooperate with God, not only in the work in our own life, but in the work that He's doing in other, other people's lives. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, and verse 24. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. Talking about dealing with others. If you've ever said anything to people about Christianity and about the Lord, you know that sometimes people don't like it. Uh, you know, they don't always respond sweetly. Uh, and he says here in, in 2 Timothy 2, 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God her adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Great verses, aren't they? You know, that's, we're on the Lord's side. And even when people wrong us, we need to be thinking, you know, what is the Lord doing in my life, in their life, and be looking for the glory of God. Now, this is the kind of thing that's easy to say, hard to do. <laughs> All right? And there's a lot of Christian principles like that. They're easy to, to say. But to put them into practice, sometimes you, you really have to uh, steel yourself to it. Uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big part of life. And you can choose to forgive. You can choose not to forgive. For, for some, maybe you have some bitterness in your life, and you can choose to turn that bitterness to forgiveness. Uh, that, that's the next point we want to we look at here. Turning bitterness to forgiveness. Number one, build a bigger frame of reference. And what we're saying there is don't just look at it in a small way. You don't just concentrate on the offense or, or the offender. <coughs> Do you remember last week we looked at Matthew 18 where Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And you kind of get the impression he thought he was being really magnanimous, you know. I, I won't bust his jaw the first time. I'll give him seven times, you know. And Jesus' answer was, no, 70 times 7. And I think he's saying we just need to forgive. And the illustration he gave was of the man who owed his master 10,000 talents. Remember that? I've heard that could be the equivalent of like $15 million. And his master forgave him. And then he went out and somebody owed him, I can't remember, 100 pence or something. It was like $15. And he wouldn't forgive him. And had him thrown in jail. Now, the servant did not have a big frame of reference. He wasn't even looking at what his master had done for him. And you know, as, as Christians, uh, we need to see uh, life is not just us. You know, there's the whole world. Uh, there's eternity. <laughs> it's a big, it's a, a big situation that we're in with time and, and space and so on. 
and especially then when you applied the fact that God has forgiven you. And if you'll understand how God has forgiven you, I think I'm right in saying no one will ever wrong you as much as you've wronged God. No one will ever wrong me as much as I've wronged God. And if we'll put it in that perspective, that'll help us. That'll help us with, with bitterness. Life is not just me. It's not just you. Secondly, consider the consequences of not forgiving. And we've talked about this some in the past, but you know, if you don't forgive, it's going to develop a person like Shimei. Is that really the kind of person you want to be? I mean, really. You know, when, you, when you think of your ideal self, is it a cursing, snarling, nasty piece of work? You know? I hope not. It's amazing how in families and societies we can idealize the wrong thing. Now, there's whole cultures where, um, I think I'm right in saying in Papua New Guinea, for instance, payback. Man, that's, that's part of the culture. Uh, there was one missionary who was teaching about Christianity, and when he came to the, what he taught about Judas, oh, they got excited. That was the hero. I think that was an Irian Jaya or Papua New Guinea, one of those. Because, you see, they thought the guy who was clever and could make a good payback, that's the hero. Their whole society had been corrupted by not forgiving. Uh, we need to consider the consequences of not forgiving. It's going to affect, it's a little bit down the line there, it's going to pass on to others, uh, to our children. And, uh, you know, if I'm a bitter father and I raise bitter children, when I get old, those bitter children are going to look after me. <laughs> That's not, that's not how I want to live. I don't know about you. But you know, that, that happens a lot. It, it can affect our physical health. Uh, fatigue and illness uh, can come because of, of bitterness. And of course, it affects our spiritual health. One of the things that happens when, when people don't forgive, it, it causes them to doubt their own salvation. Matthew chapter 6 and uh, verses 12 through 15, we've looked at these several times, but uh, Matthew 6, verses 12 through 15, is part of it is the model prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Have you ever spent much time thinking about that? Is that really how you want to be forgiven? Should be. Uh, we should forgive. Uh, he says in, in verse 14, if, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Those are stark words. Now, we need to consider it's going to affect us spiritually. It can cause us to have trouble loving. Now, I, I think most of us want to love and, and be loved. But if we won't forgive, it's going to make that difficult. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, he talks here about the difference between saying and doing. 1 John 4, verse 20 says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Boy, yeah, God puts things really straight to the point, doesn't he? For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. You know, when, when we won't forgive, it's going to cause us to really doubt our relationships. I, I've seen this quite often where people assume the other person has a, a thought toward them. And we don't know people's thoughts. But if we're devious, you're going to expect other people to be devious. If you're wicked, you're going to expect other people to be, devi be wicked and so on. And, you know, it just, it just happens often. And if a person isn't forgiving, they're going to struggle to think that someone else loves them. They're going to struggle to think that God loves them. They're going to feel like they have to earn it and deserve it. You know, if, if I can't love you, how can I love God? It's basically what he's saying there. Uh, consider the consequences of not forgiving. You pass it on. Uh, you can become like the person that you resent. Let me, let me get that uh, picture up on, on the screen there. When, when you don't forgive a person, one of the things that happens is you, you tend to concentrate on them. You tend to have a bit of a focus on them. And, uh, you know, the thing that you focus on, you become like. 
think I mentioned to you last week, a, a young person was told that if they didn't forgive someone, they're going to become like them. They said, oh, I'll forgive, I'll forgive. Uh, we need to realize that. I don't know if you can see that very well, but a wrong emotional focus is contempt. You know, we react to that offense and we concentrate on them and uh, review their, their offensive actions, and that causes us to, to become like them. We may not have exactly the same action, but we'll have the same heart in the matter. I remember hearing of a, of a young man whose, whose dad was just all over the place, you know, unfaithful and a drinker and so on, and, and he, was, he was determined never to be like his dad. And he didn't drink, and he was faithful to his wife, and he was startled one day to hear her say to him, you're just like your dad. He didn't do the things he did, but he, he'd concentrated on him. He hadn't forgiven his dad, and he'd become like him in, in spirit. Uh, we don't want to be like the ones that wrong us. We want to forgive. As well, when we don't forgive, go ahead to the, to the next one. It narrows the scope of our life. Uh, You'll uh, appreciate this because you've probably experienced it at some time or another. Um, someone offends you, an undeserved offense, and you resent it. And so there's a barrier between you and that person. Now, it, this doesn't have, always have to even be a person. I, I've seen people do this with shops. Man, Kmart, I don't like it. I'm not going to Kmart anymore. Well, then next is Target. Oh, Target, I, they're no good. I'm not going to Kmart or Target. Pretty soon you're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, go ahead to the next one. Because the thing that happens then is the person that, that you have a barrier with, their friends resent you as well. And you resent them. So all these barriers are springing up. Uh, the more you don't forgive, the narrower your life becomes. Sometimes it's family members. Sometimes it's neighbors. Sometimes it's uh, just uh, various people. But it narrows the scope of our life. I think I've shared this with you before. I had a time, oh, some years ago, uh, I'd resigned to church. They'd called a new pastor, and we were going away. And the day we were leaving, one of the men called me. And it, this was a man who, at that time, was planning to go into the ministry and was you know, studying at our Bible college and so on. Uh, he, he called me, and we got together, and he just reamed me out. He, he criticized me up one side and down the other. <laughs> And then I got in the plane and left. <laughs> it was really fun. Um, and my tendency was, well, I'll never have to see him again. But you know, I realized he's training for the ministry. It could be that God would, would want us to work together. And so I wrote him. And it, it, I don't know, can't remember exactly what I said, but I just basically left the door open. Said, you know, if, if God has it in the future, you know, uh, I'm willing to, to do what God has uh, between you and me. Well, he, he thought it meant I wanted to work with him, which, which wasn't the, the, the key. But uh, yeah, the point is this. We need to keep the doors open as best we can. Uh, it's like the verse in, in Romans 12, right next to the one we read earlier, where he says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, you do your best to to forgive and to keep the door open, to have a right uh, relationship. You can't decide what other people do. Uh, but be careful. Uh, not forgiving makes your life narrower and narrower and narrower. Uh, the third thing there is discover new direction in life. Let me go ahead and see that, that fourth one there. The, the opposite of focusing on the wrong is focusing on Jesus. Uh, someone has said, I don't remember where I saw this now, but it said, our glance should be on the problem, our gaze should be on the Lord. Yeah, we're going to look at our problems from time to time. But that shouldn't be our focus. Our focus needs to be on the Lord. And when we'll confess, when we'll deal with our part, and by the way, folks, that's the only part you can deal with. <laughs> it's your part. And when you counsel people, they always want you to deal with the other person, but the only person that, that they can deal with is themselves. Confession, fully forgive the one toward whom we had a wrong emotional focus. Uh, concentrate on the Lord. And that will help you to be conformed to the image of Christ. And really, uh, theoretically, that's what we want. Although sometimes in practice, we don't, don't always live that way. Uh, becoming like the one you love, Jesus Christ. Uh, get your eyes off of those who have wronged you and keep your eyes on Jesus. And by the way, the Lord will give you practice in this. 
I guarantee you, it'll come up. Uh, sometimes it'll be little things. Sometimes it'll be major things. Uh, but each one has to be dealt with. Uh, the Lord Jesus certainly dealt with some major things, and he did it for us. If, if you've had opportunity to get bitter, uh, here's some things that maybe would help you, uh, basic steps toward forgiveness. Uh, if you have bitterness toward an offender, confess to God that you've been looking at it from your point of view. Yeah, you've not been considering what God might be doing. You've not been considering uh, that person's need. You've just been considering your hurt. And uh, you need to confess that, that to the Lord. And then reevaluate the offenses from, from God's point of view. You know, God is always at work. And in strange, strange ways. You know, sometimes the, the worst thing that will happen to you, God will take that and he'll give you a ministry. It, you know, it's just an amazing thing that God can turn what we think are bad things into good things. The example to me, I, now I, I don't know if other people see this or not, I, is the cross. You know, Jesus goes to the cross. It, it's like Satan has beaten God. And God uses it to work salvation. You know, he takes a wicked, terrible thing. They say it's probably one of the worst ways of putting someone to death ever invented. And our Lord went through it for us. Terrible thing. And yet it's the, the way of salvation. And God says, God forbid that I would glory save in the cross. What a wonderful thing that God can do. And you know, with the situations we face... We look at it and we think, oh, terrible, and yet God can do something good with it. Now, God's not the author of confusion. He's not the author of sin. Don't, don't think I'm saying that. God doesn't send sin into your life. But God does have us live in the world, and there's people. Uh, you know, I, I deal with other people's sin, but, you know, the worst one I have to deal with is the guy I look at in the mirror in the morning, and that's me. Uh, Reevaluate the offense from, from God's point of view. And then give your offender a clean record as far as you're concerned and transfer any need for punishment to God and those he's ordained for this. Now, by, by saying that, I don't mean be foolish. Uh, if someone is a, a criminal, uh, you, you don't ignore that and, and, and so on. Uh, but do your best to uh, look at them through, through God's eyes and look for ways that you can benefit or encourage them Last week, I gave an illustration of a young fellow that had been a man had tried to murder him. Do you remember that, that story? It was true. And uh, as an adult, he visited that man in prison and ended up leading him to the Lord right before he died you know, within a few weeks. And he, that, man, that young man who now is a grown man, he and his family were basically the only ones at the funeral. Uh, what a sad life that, that fellow had who tried to murder him. And yet he looked for ways to, to benefit and, and encourage him. And his comment was he had to forgive so that he could be the man that God wanted him, him to be. Let me just close with a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse, verse 44. I mentioned earlier, God has a rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And in these verses, he really puts it all uh, into just a few sentences. Matthew 5, verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know, what a blessing that God loves us and forgives us. And He says, choose that path. Choose the path to be like Jesus. Uh, God forgives us because He wants to forgive us. And He paid the price so that we could be forgiven. Uh, we need to be like Jesus. All right, well, let's close in a word of prayer. And if you have questions or if I can be of help to you afterwards, uh, feel free to, to speak to me. Father, thank you so much for your word.